Good morning, everybody. Thank you for watching today's online service. We hope you are blessed by today. We're gonna to start the service out with some worship and then we're gonna go straight into the sermon. Pastor Jason is continuing his sermon series on Mark and we just really hope that you're blessed by the message and the music this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> Why'd you guys come in and find your seats as we prepare for worship this morning? And your name The mountains shake and crumble And your name The oceans roar and tumble And your name Angels will bow your people cry out Lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh, Yahweh we love to shout your name oh Lord and your name Shout your name, filling up the skies in this praise, in this praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we will sing. We will sing, there is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. Welcome to Kettle Marine Community Church. If you are new with us this morning, we want to welcome you here. Please fill out one of the connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. Throw them in the offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary. They're on either side of the door back there. You can also throw your regular giving in there. There are also envelopes for benevolent, um, our benevolent fund in those boxes too. So if you want to give to our benevolent fund, put it in the envelope, then put it in the box. Um, also, we have Children's Church today that is dismissed halfway through the service. If you do not want to send your kid out to Children's Church and you want them to stay here in, with you, that's great. We also have activity bags for them. Um, they are across from the bathroom, so if you go out the doors to the left, you'll find the bags right there on the wall. Um, just a couple things. Um, just a reminder, we have open classrooms throughout 
um, the building. So if you would like to distance yourself or have a crying baby, everything like that, there is rooms available for that. And the sermon and the audio and everything is pumped to those rooms as well. So that is available for you. Also, there is still signups for Generations. Out in the foyer, uh, on the Bichot tables, there's these as well. This has all the information for Generations on it. It's on the back side of it. Um, but just some brief info, it's going to be the first and Thursday of ev or first and third Thursday of every month starting in September. Um, it is for the whole church. So if you are old or young, we want you to come out. It'll be a lot of fun. There'll be games, food, all that good stuff. All the info is on the back of these postcards. There are signups in the foyer as well on the tables for attendance, um, for volunteers, all that kind of stuff. Just look into that. Um, also, um, we need volunteers for pretty much everything. So if you want to help out in um, children's church or nursery or the toddler room or to be a greeter or an usher, if you want to join me up here, if you play an instrument or if you want to pretend like you play an instrument, whatever you want to do, come find me or you can email the office. We'd love to have you um, and we'd love to plug you in that way. Also, last thing I have, today at 6.30 p.m. at the Naps House, uh, we are having the college group tonight at 6.30. There'll be a bonfire. Um, and there'll be some food there as well. So if you have any questions about that, you can come see me or Micah Knapp, who's in the sound booth right now, or Jason and Kelly, or pretty much any of the Knapp family you can find and talk to about it, except for Todd and Carol, because they don't live there, so that's okay. Um, Bill, why don't you open us up in a word of prayer? Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this day, for this beautiful weather, for the time that we have to share together, lifting up your name, and just bringing you praise and glory. All that you provide for us, all that you bless us with, we just praise and thank you today, Lord. We ask that you would just touch our hearts, that you would give us the ability to comprehend and understand, hear your word, and let it sink into our hearts and have meaning to us. And Lord, help us to go forth and just share your word with those that we come upon that uh, have open minds and those that we, uh, feel the need to share with, and just pray, Lord, that you would just put people in our lives that are just open to your word and that you would lift us up and strengthen us in all the things that we look to accomplish. We claim this all in your blessed name. Amen. All right, why don't you guys stand and worship with us this morning. My hope is built on nothing less Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name
life then in him be found just in his righteousness alone faultless and before the throne Christ
for the offering. Uh, Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity to gather as a body. Uh, Lord, we just ask that while we're here, we just put the things of the world uh, that are going on right now behind us, Lord, that we can just concentrate and be here to praise you and worship you and hear your word. And, uh, Lord, we just uh, know you're in control and we just look forward to being on the other side of all this craziness. Lord, we just want to pray for this offering, Lord. Uh, just pray that as, as a body that we give freely and willingly. There's uh, no one here to tell you what you need to do. It's just it's from your heart. But Lord, we pray as a church and as a body of elders that we would be good stewards of your money and, and have you direct us what you have us to do with it. So Lord, we just ask your blessing on the remainder of our morning. And we just pray these things in your name. Why don't you ask to stand up? If you want to turn there, if you if you can, if you please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 45. It'll be on the screen behind me and also in your Bibles in front of you. 
Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, oh, sorry, back up to 32. I started in the wrong spot. Here we go, verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, Do you, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who consider rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant." And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. You may be seated. So today we're going to be talking about Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Uh, Today's episode in the life of Jesus is incredibly important for us to hear. This is the midpoint in Mark's gospel. Uh, This passage is the central focus of Mark's message to the early church who were persecuted and suffering. And this is the culmination or the crowning statement, I believe, of Jesus defining and modeling discipleship. This is the unveiling of the purpose of Jesus' coming. This passage demonstrates the ethics and morality of the kingdom of God. This passage defines true greatness. This passage describes the character and the nature of God. And Out of all the passages in Mark, I love this passage. It is a wonderful passage that shows us the heart of who we worship and serve. So here we go. In God's kingdom, we're going to look at three points. In God's kingdom, power is courage and humility and service. It's power and humility and service. So, we're going to courage first in verse 32 to 34. It's the story of Jesus walking down the road. It's his third passion prediction. It says that those who followed Jesus were afraid. So, they're on the road. They're going up to Jerusalem. And yes, Jesus was headed to Jerusalem, but he was also headed to the cross. Jesus was on the road to the cross, to mocking and spitting and flogging and death. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. Did you see that? Jesus was not lagging behind, not slowing his pace, not planning for other routes, for ways to run. No, Jesus was walking a steady gait straight down the road to Jerusalem. And he was telling them what would happen. So look, we're we're going to Jerusalem. You can see it. There's the temple gleaming in the distance. We're almost there. And when we get there, the Son of Man will be delivered over twice. He's going to be delivered over first to the chief priests and the scribes. So a man, a friend, a trusted companion will betray me and deliver me over to the religious elite. I'll be delivered over to the ones who are supposed to be leading us to worship the Father in heaven. But instead of receiving me, and in receiving me, receiving my Father, they will reject me. They will not receive me. They will refuse to believe in me. Their hearts are hard, they are unbelieving, they are blind, and they are deaf. And they're going to condemn me to death. 
They will sentence me to death because of my claim to be the Son of God. So Jesus is explaining this to his disciples. And he says, second, delivering over, I'm going to be delivered to the Gentiles. My own people, the Jews, the ones I've healed and helped and fed and taught. The very ones to whom I've offered life and been recipients of my love. The ones who I've touched and comforted. These very same ones will turn me over. And they're going to mock me. And Jesus is, Jesus is going through and he's, he's going to be the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22. In Psalm chapter 22, verse 6 to 8 says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Don't you hate it when you're mocked? It's frustrating and it's humiliating. You want to prove that the mocker is wrong, that they're, you want to put them in their place. If you open your mouth, they're only going to mock you more. You can't put them in their place. It has to be endured. Jesus knows what it's like to be mocked. And it says they're going to spit on him. And this isn't so much a custom here in the USA, but in other parts of the world, if someone despises you or if they want to display their contempt for you, they will spit on you. Think of it. Jesus had used his spittle to heal a deaf man in chapter 7, and he healed a, a blind man with his spittle in chapter, chapter 8. He, brought, he used it to bring healing and wholeness, and yet people were going to spit on him an action meant to inflict psychological harm, an action meant to shame and to embarrass and to harass. Jesus knows what it's like to be shamed and embarrassed. And it says he's going to be flogged. Back to Psalm chapter 22, verses 14 to 15. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaw, and you lay me in the dust of death. Jesus knew he was going to receive 39 lashes with a whip, a whip laced with shards of glass and bone. His flesh would be torn off of him. He would be bleeding profusely. He would be thirsty and exhausted and agony and lying in the dust of death. Jesus knows what it's like to be in agony and pain. And then they would kill him. Psalm chapter 22 goes on. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and my clothing they cast lots. So the dogs, the Gentiles, remember, that was the derogatory term for them, would encircle him and would kill him in the most gruesome execution style known to mankind, a crucifixion. Hands and feet being pierced, stretched out on a wooden beam, exposed to the elements, suffocation and starvation, and dehydration and exhaustion. Jesus knows what it's like to die. How could anyone continue walking down the road to Jerusalem knowing full well that this was in their future? How was it that Jesus said all of this and did not want to just turn and run as fast as he possibly could, as far away as he possibly could go? And I would offer to you that it's because he saw beyond the pain, beyond the suffering, beyond the rejection, beyond the death, to resurrection. To resurrection. After three days, he will rise. And this was Jesus' hope. It wasn't wishful thinking. He didn't take comfort in spite of all the agony and death with a chance of resurrection. It was inevitable. He knew it would happen. It was certain. Resurrection was just as much a reality as the mocking and the spitting and the flogging and the killing. Resurrection is real. Aside from suffering and sacrifice in this life, it is the one thing we can be certain will happen. This is our hope as Christians. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet 
shall he live. And whoever believes in, or lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus knows what it's like to be resurrected. And people need this hope. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. I think C.S. Lewis was right on. Bringing the promise of hope of a resurrection through belief in Jesus into the lives of people is what Jesus came to offer and what he left us here to do. It is, what, it is the one thing that brings peace and joy in the midst of the pain of life. Now, why do those who don't believe in Jesus strive and fight and riot and kill? Because for them, this is all there is. If it doesn't get any better than this, then they'll do anything to make this the best ride that they can make it. It only makes sense. Hope in the resurrection, though, brings peace. It brings joy. It, bring, it unites people. It, it gives courage because there's something else to look forward to. And it says that they were amazed and surprised as they followed Jesus. Now, why amazement and why surprise? Because of what Jesus was telling them along the way. He was convinced that all of this would happen. And yet he was still walking on ahead of them. He knew his fate and yet he was undeterred. If he was afraid, he did not let the fear stop him. Mark Twain said it this way, Courage is resistance to fear. Mastery of fear, not absence of fear. Basically, he said, courage is not the absence of fear, but the mastery of it. Nothing was going to stop Jesus from walking the way to the cross. He had courage because he had hope. And why were the disciples afraid? Would they suffer the same fate? Were they ready to suffer the same fate right now? Mocking and spitting and flogging and killing does not sound like a lot of fun. They didn't and yet they didn't understand the reality of the resurrection yet. They were not convinced that resurrection was possible. Resurrection is not something we see every day. It wasn't something they had seen every day. The only one that has been raised and continues to live is Jesus. But that's where faith comes in. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith doesn't make resurrection a reality. Jesus does not teach us that by faith we will things into existence. We have no power to do that. Faith helps us see what reality is. Resurrection is a dimension of reality. Resurrection exists even though we can't see it. Faith allows us to live in the reality that we cannot see, that being resurrection. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we, what? We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Resurrection to an eternal life. And they were amazed and afraid, but it says that they followed him. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's mastery of it. From our story, Jesus teaches us that courage is walking ahead, knowing what's ahead, and not letting the knowledge turn you back. It's walking ahead, knowing what's ahead, but not letting that knowledge turn you back. Years ago, I read a book entitled Flags of Our Fathers, and it's the story of U.S. Marines who landed on the island of Iwo Jima and successfully took a heavily fortified island, even though they were outnumbered and they were crawling up a beach 
with enemy fire right in their faces. It was a cra- crazy book. And then I read the book, The Ghost Mountain Boys. Not as, not as popular of a book, but it's the story of Australian and U.S. soldiers who were outnumbered like 10 to 1 and undersupplied, and they were in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. And so they went from the hot, mosquito-infested rainforest up to the 10,000-foot cold mountains, and there were a few hundred men that were tasked with holding off thousands and thousands of the enemy. And it was scary. These men, though, did not allow their fear to paralyze them. And I've never, I've never lived through a pandemic before, so I, I can't say that my judgment of how things was handled is the best or not, but it seems to me that we could stand to learn something from the courage of Jesus and the disciples. The probability for death for Jesus was 100%. The probability of death for us is less than 2%. Jesus knew he would be flogged and suffer terrible agony and suffocation and dehydration and starvation. We know we may get sick. Our present situation presents us with incredible opportunities to share the hope of Jesus with those who may die and go to a hopeless eternity. Perhaps we need to look at the example of Jesus and the disciples and reset our priorities. Jesus could have turned off the road to Jerusalem and said, forget it. It's going to be too painful, too difficult, too risky for everyone around me. But he didn't. Jesus said, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will find it. The Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. Living with the hope of resurrection to eternal life with Jesus is the call of a disciple. The church has traditionally been the ones to run where the need is. So they could offer help and offer hope of Jesus. And today I see much of our Christian friends fleeing to corners, worried and fearful of being fined and maligned and mocked or accused. We, like the disciples, are following Jesus in amazement and in fear, still skeptical that resurrection exists. But the disciples eventually were convinced. And once they were, it changed everything. Like Jesus, they all served and gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. What would it look like if we were convinced of the reality of resurrection just as much as we are convinced of the reality of suffering? My prayer for this church is that we follow Jesus convinced of the, res- of the reality of resurrection and thus courageously helping those in need while sharing the hope of the gospel, Jesus, because that's what they need, and we have what they need. Second point is humility. Verse 35 to 41, we have this this dialogue between James and John and Jesus. And James and John, they're two members of Jesus' inner circle. And after Jesus' first passion prediction, a couple, couple chapters ago, Peter pulled Jesus aside and he, he rebuked Jesus for saying, you know, you're, you're, he's going to die and, 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 and suffer and all that. And Jesus, in return, he rebuked Peter and said the famous words, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And then after Jesus' second passion prediction, John told Jesus that he had stopped a man from casting out demons in Jesus' name. And Jesus responded with another saying, whoever is not against us is for us, remember? And here we have Jesus' third passion prediction. And we have James and John coming right up after he's talking about all this, and they demand something of him. They say, do for us whatever we ask. Doesn't that strike you as a bit presumptuous, a bit odd, a bit demanding? Why would they be so bold as to ask him this this question? I think that Matthew in his gospel records something that can maybe help us fill in the blanks a little bit. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 to 20, Jesus says this. Jesus said, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree... On earth, so James and John, if two of you shall agree on, on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. Okay, so not too far out of realm of possibility. So any, if, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Oh, so one on the right and one on the left and Jesus in the middle. 
So in Matthew's gospel, this statement by Jesus came in response to the disciples asking Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus had put a child on his lap and talked about receiving children, just like we looked at a few weeks ago. And I wonder if possibly they had forgotten about the child and forgotten about all the rest that Jesus had had said, and they focused on this statement. Many times we hear only what we want to hear, right? In any case, they came to Jesus jockeying for position, ahead of Peter. Notice he's not in there, and he's part of the inner circle of three, right? A little bit of dissension to camp, possibly. So Jesus answers. I can see Jesus kind of tilt his head and squint a little bit and bite his lip and say, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus is all-knowing, so he knows what they're going to ask, but he still gives them a chance to ask it. People need the opportunity to work through their beliefs and their presumptions and their understandings, their questions and their hopes and dreams as they walk on the road to the cross. It's all part of becoming mature. So Jesus gives them an opportunity to respond, and they say, Grant to us to sit on your left and your right in glory. Now that's quite a request. I'm a little reserved, so I'm not sure that I could have gotten up the nerve to request that of Jesus. That's pretty big. But if you remember, these two brothers were bigger than life. They're known as what? The sons of thunder, right? So my guess is they're pretty big personalities, and they're not intimidated by too much. Um, So, yeah, Jesus, you know, after you go through all this suffering and agony and you die and stuff, and then you rise from the dead, well, would you, could you let us sit on your right and your left? That would be pretty cool, right? This request just shows how deep-seated our hunger for greatness is. How prideful we can be. Jesus has talked nonstop about being last, about giving up our lives, about being a servant, about sacrificing, about being like a child, and it it all went over their heads. They didn't catch the things that he said. But Jesus, he's he's so patient, so gracious, so long-suffering. Jesus responds, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup Metaphorically means experience the fate. Are you able to experience the fate that I will experience? You know, what I just talked about, mocking and spitting and flogging and dying. Are you able to endure that? Or to be baptized with the baptism. I'll be baptized with. This means it's a metaphor for being submerged into difficulty and struggle and calamity. Are you able to do this? And they say, we are able. Of course we're able. If that's the way to glory, bring it on, sons of thunder. Somewhere along the way, they looked at their ministry with Jesus as a means of getting a platform for greatness, where they could wield power and influence over others. That's what they wanted. They were using Jesus for their own advancement. And yet somehow, somehow, Jesus is not indignant or angry or even contradictory. Jesus simply and calmly affirms that they will indeed drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism. Jesus knows what's in store for their future, for them in their future, and Jesus knows that they will eventually get the idea, that they will understand the concept that he's been teaching them all along this road to Jerusalem, and that they will suffer for it. This most likely refers to the fact that James would be martyred in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and that John would be exiled to the island of Patmos for the things that he believed. And Jesus is patient. He's always, he always has the long view in sight. He's, he's so gracious. He's, he's looking for humility, and he gives us time to work that into our lives. And again, these disciples get it wrong. Even in their acknowledgement that Jesus was the Messiah and that he would be resurrected to glory, to rule and reign, they still have misguided motives. They still have the desire to be recognized and to be great and to be first, and they're still proud and arrogant. And it's just like us. 
As I said before, Mark, I think, puts these disciples in here so we can see ourselves in them. And it's a subtle sin that hides in each one of us. We will minister and we'll serve and we'll suffer, whatever, but we do it so that we can be great, so that we can be first eventually, so that we can be noticed, so that we can get a reward. We use Jesus for our own gain. And it doesn't work like that in the kingdom of God, where Jesus is king. We don't use Jesus for what he can do for us. We accept Jesus for what he's done for us. The reward is Jesus, not some position. And this takes humility. And so Jesus says, that's not mine to grant. Jesus has all authority and power in heaven and on earth. He commands the sea, he raises the dead, he feeds the masses, he heals the sick, but he humbly abdicates all that power and lives to serve the purposes of the Father. He's a perfect example. Positions of power are not for the proud, but for the humble. A humble heart can only be determined by the righteous and impartial judge of human hearts and human motives, and that's God the Father. It is, and so it is for those who it has been prepared ahead of time. Only God the Father knows who that is. It's for those who have suffered. It's for those who have humbly served. It's for those who have given their lives for Jesus and the sake of the gospel. It's humility. And so the ten were indignant. They were probably all jockeying for power too, kicking themselves that they hadn't asked first. And now it was ruined for all of them. The cat's out of the bag, right? They were mad because James and John did not consider all of them in their request. How dare they go off on their own and ask for this prestigious position without even consulting them? And Satan was trying to get a foothold. Anything to break up, Jesus banned the brothers. Anything to cause division. So Jesus squashes it. Service. Verses 42 to 45, and I'm going to read this portion again. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus summoned them to himself. And you just got to picture this. James and John asked this question, right? So they received Jesus' response, which is basically putting them into their place. And they fall behind Jesus a little bit on the path as he continues on ahead to lick their wounds and to grumble like we always do. Then comes Peter, the hothead, right? He's the one who's going to take a sword later and cut off one of the one of the priest's ears, he's a fighter, right? He comes up next to the two, taps one on the shoulder, roughly, and asks, what was that about? I was on the mountain with the two of you too. How dare you try to one-up me? And then come uh, the other disciples, and they're like, well, who died and made the three of you to rule over us, right? You're not going to rule over us. We don't have to listen to you. And my guess is they were pretty close to physically having it out with one another, right there on the road to Jerusalem. It says that they were indignant. They're pretty upset. And Jesus turns around and says, all of you get over here. So the master's not too happy. And he talks about this idea of lording it over. And he says, you guys, you know what it's like to live under rulers who lord it over you. You've been under the thumbs of the Romans your whole lives. The Gentiles, the ones in power at the moment, they lord it over them. Literally, they exercise dominion, they subdue, they are fear mongers. The great ones exercise authority, literally, they wield power over you at their will, oftentimes not fairly, not justly, not in anyone's benefit but their own. They manipulate through fear. Do you like that? Do you like being under the authority of another? That's how the world does it. That's how the world gets and maintains power. And that's what you guys are trying to do right now. But that's not how it is for you, he says. 
In my kingdom, no one wields power, subdues others, or exercises dominion over another. That's God's position. Whoever would be great must be servant. The word in Greek is diakonos. It's an attendant, a waiter, someone who brings food. Remember, Jesus had brought food. He served food to the masses. Whoever would be first must be slave. That word is doulos. It literally means slave, someone that's enslaved to another. So you must, whoever be great, whoever would be first, must be servant, be slave to all. Wow. It means that we serve God and we serve everyone else. For he alone, God alone is great. He sets the precedent for greatness. He defined greatness. And how did he do that? That's verse 45. Verse 45. And this verse is the key, I believe, to Mark's whole gospel. It's right in the center. I think all of his gospel focuses right on this verse. It's the summary saying of Jesus. The whole gospel is actually wrapped up in this verse. Jesus, son, and servant. To me, it's one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. I would encourage you to memorize it, repeat it, remember it. Make it part of who you are. It displays the servant heart of God. It explains the sacrificial purpose of the Messiah. It speaks of Jesus' death as our substitutionary atonement. It reverses the selfish ways of the world. It establishes the selfless pattern of discipleship. It maps out the sacrificial way of Jesus. It teaches us of the goodness of God. It models the love of Jesus. It affirms the immeasurable value of each human life. It condemns the power-hungry way of the world. It exalts the nature of Jesus' kingdom. And it summons us to a new way of life, the way of Jesus. For even the Son of Man came not to be served. The Son of Man. We've looked at this term through, through Mark, and we're going to continue to look at it. The Son of Man, the one who is going to one day stand before the Ancient of Days and receive from the Ancient of Days, from God the Father, God Almighty. He's going to receive dominion. And there's that, that word meaning rule and glory and a kingdom and all peoples and nations and languages should serve him from Daniel chapter 7. This incredible Son of Man came not to be served. He did not come to be served. The Son of Man's purpose was not, at this point in time, to be glorified and to receive dominion and power and a name. His purpose was to serve us. He knew that glorification and greatness are preceded by service, just as resurrection is preceded by death. God came in human flesh, not to be served, but to serve it is really hard to wrap our heads around this. God, the creator of the universe, came to be what he created. God, the creator of life, came to die. God, the Lord of hosts, the commander of legions of angel armies, came to serve food. God, the king of kings and lord of lords, came to live among paupers. God, the perfect unblemished, glorious, holy being came to serve the sick and touch the lepers. God, the creator of light, came into darkness to seek and save the lost. God, the owner of all that exists, came and gave it all to ransom you and me. And Jesus is the demonstration of the character and nature of this amazing God. If you ever want to know what God was like or how he acts or what motivates him or what he values or how he relates to mankind, you look at Jesus. And God displayed to us exactly what his character is in the person of Jesus Christ. He is humble and meek and gentle and kind and gracious and loving and courageous and sacrificial and generous and just and righteous and persistent and long-suffering. Who wouldn't want to follow a God like that? Who wouldn't want to worship a God like that? You'd have to be a fool not to. And if you reject this incredible God, King David said that is exactly what you are, a fool. Psalm 53, 1 says, A fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
And the Apostle Paul would, would say the same thing in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks, claiming to be wise, they became fools. The world is going to tell you the opposite, that it is foolish to believe in God. It's a crutch. Or to believe in Jesus. It's just, you're trying to get out of it all. But the world lies. God's word is truth. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus yet, don't be a fool. Do it today. And this incredible God that we're describing, this God that would leave it all to come down to earth for us, will ransom and save you. For Jesus' purpose was to give his life as a ransom for many. And that word, just, that word many is just a big way, another way of saying all. It was his purpose to serve. And how did he serve? By giving his life a ransom for many. Love nowadays is, is trying to help people avoid pain, protecting people from pain, fixing the pain. But Jesus didn't do this. Instead, he came underneath us and served us by bearing the pain and agony of our guilt and our death. Jesus didn't model for us an avoidance of or protection from or quick fix for pain. He modeled service by bearing pain, by becoming a ransom. A ransom is a price that's paid in order to free slaves or captives. It's blood money. In the Roman culture, there were millions of slaves, most coming from the lands that the, that the Romans had conquered. And the slaves were, were owned just as we own vehicles or homes or or whatever, and, and they were treated as such, like possessions. The slaves are bought and sold in the port cities at the marketplaces and the streets, just like merchandise on your Waukesha you know, farmer's market on Saturdays. When an individual was purchased as a slave, they were, they were, the, the owner was paid a ransom, a payment that would allow the slave to be someone else's, to be his. Once the ransom was paid, the slave was expected to serve the new master. There were some wealthy and benevolent folks who would purchase slaves and then actually set them free. And there were times that the freed slaves in a situation like that would actually prefer to stay in the service of the one who ransomed them because they were safer, provided for, and they, they had overwhelming gratitude for the one who would purchase their freedom and willfully let them go. And so they'd willfully serve that master. When we're born into this world, we are born into slavery, enslaved to our sin, enslaved to laws and rules, enslaved to the enemy of our souls, Satan. Satan is the ruler of anyone who's not in Christ, and his rule is one, has only one and one goal, and that's destruction of mankind. And furthermore, in ourselves, we're enslaved to sin. Our thoughts and our actions, our desires, are all prone to sin. And we're enslaved to laws and rules, and the reality is that there's no way for us on our own, to be freed from sin and Satan and laws and rules and all this stuff, we cannot pay the ransom for our souls because the ransom for our souls is our own blood. Now, way back in the book of Exodus, we found the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, okay? They were slaves, and God decided he was going to ransom his people from bondage that they were in. And because the king of Egypt refused to let the people go, God sent an angel of death to kill all the firstborn sons. And God gave the firstborn Israelites a way to escape the angel of death. And here's how it was. The lamb was to be slaughtered and the blood put on the doorpost of the house where the firstborn was to be at. If the family did this, then the, the lamb acted as a substitute for the firstborn. Its blood paid the price. The firstborn was ransomed through the means of the pat sacrificial Passover lamb. And this is how Jesus' life became a ransom payment for ours. His perfect, sinless blood was given freely according to God's riches and grace as the only sufficient payment for all of us. His blood took the place of our blood. He became a slave of all. His death substituted for our death. Jesus paid it all. And all we have to do is wake up to the fact that our ransom has been paid to our captors, accept it as true, and we're free to go. Free to follow and serve the one who made it all possible. And here's how this all ties in with discipleship. Some of you may ask, doesn't being free mean that we're free to follow our own desires in our own ways, like do our own thing, right? It seems contradictory to say that we're free to follow 
and serve the one who made it all possible, the one who freed us, right? Doesn't that seem contradictory? It might seem that way until we come to understand that none of us is entirely free, as we Americans would define freedom. If we define freedom according to kind of what popular culture defines it, then freedom is completely throwing off every restraint, deconstructing every authority, distancing from every other person on the planet, reversing good and evil. According to our culture's definition, I, I am free to do anything I want. That's what freedom is to our culture. I get to choose to take a life or not. I get to choose my gender. I get to choose to hate someone or not. I get to choose to work or not. I get to choose whether to harm someone or not. And this is not freedom. This is not the freedom Jesus was talking about. Just look around at our society. Do you think this is what Jesus wanted for us? Absolutely not. Because that's not freedom at all. It is enslavement to self. It's idolizing my own greatness and my own desires above everyone else's. It's seeking my own glory and my own authority and my own autonomy. This was never God's intention. If we are not worshiping God, then we're worshiping something else. If we're not serving God, we're serving our own purposes or something else. If we're not slaves to God then we're slaves to sin. Everybody is in bondage to something. It's just what you're going to be in bondage to. And if we're absolutely honest with ourselves, the only reason we want to say that we're free to follow our own desires is so we can follow our own desires, right? But they always are sinful, and they always lead to death. However, if we follow Jesus, his desires and his way lead to resurrection life. Jesus' ransom was not meant to be a free pass to go on living the lives that we were living before he ransomed us. For that would not be a loving thing for God to do. He came to save us from that life. Our former way of life is what got us into the mess that we were in in the first place. The life we needed to be saved from. So if we're set free, why would we go back to that? We are set free so we can follow Jesus. We are set free so that we can choose to serve him instead of ourselves. And this is where Romans chapter 6 comes in very, very handy. If you want to turn there, you can. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 and following. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about being free. Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Because Jesus paid it all, are we free to sin and keep going back to where we were before? He says, by no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. That's the teachings of Jesus, the way of Jesus. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, get it, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is discipleship. Serving God by following Jesus on the road to the cross. Not living our lives to be served, but to serve. Not following our own desires, but following Jesus. Not removing all authority over our life, but placing the only worthy authority over us, Jesus. Discipleship is loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Discipleship is being free to love. You know what makes Jesus so worthy of our service? His willingness to first serve 
Listen to Philippians 2. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to, grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the what? The form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. Our second point. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The reason that God is so great is because he loves so much. The reason God is so worthy of honor and praise and worship is because not only was he willing, but he actually did serve and forgive us and die for us. Therefore, Philippians continues, God has highly exalted him because of his service. Those who will be who would be last will be first. He says, therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's what this verse is talking about. The reason that God is a worthy authority is because he doesn't demand it. He doesn't lord it over. His authority is demonstrated in humility and submission and service and salvation wasn't about him it was about us who would you rather obey who would you rather follow someone who sits in an ivory tower eating caviar drinking wine isolated from anyone and everyone that would cause him discomfort or someone who sat where you sit ate bread and water served the most lowly of people and sacrificed his own comfort for the sake of others you know who you'd rather follow it's a no-brainer Therefore, he deserves all the glory and all the dominion and all the rule and all the power because he didn't wield power, but he willingly gave it up. He is worthy of being followed wherever he goes, even to the cross. And I hope you'll see that the world will tell you all kinds of terrible things about this God we're talking about. They, they question God, they accuse God, they blame God, they reject God, and they lie. Because all along it was God who loved us enough to serve us by dying as a ransom for our lives. Every one of our lives. And as followers of Jesus on the road to the cross, we are not to search for greatness, to wield power what little we may have, to jockey for position, to step on the little people, to idolize safety, to grab all the wealth we can get, to to make our lives as comfortable as possible. It shall not be so among you. No, we follow Jesus, period. This means we won't necessarily be great. We won't necessarily have a lot of power. We may not have position. We will most likely be the little people. We will be walked over. We will will not be able to ensure our safety. We will not always be wealthy. We will not be able to guarantee our comfort. But we have hope of resurrection and eternal life with the most gracious and loving and compassionate and generous and powerful being in the universe, Jesus, the Son of Man. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In God's kingdom, power is courage and humility and service. Jesus served, so we serve. Jesus suffered, so we suffer. Jesus gave all for us. We give our all for him. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the incredible gift you gave us in Jesus. There's not much we can say except thank you. There's nothing we could do to save ourselves. There's nowhere we could go no one we could turn to. You are the only one who could offer us salvation. Thank you that Jesus died in our place so we could have hope of resurrection. Not not something that's not going to happen, but something that is certain to happen. Resurrection will happen, and we thank you. We have that hope in us. May it give us courage. May it give us hope. May it help us serve. May it make us home. God, guide us through this week as we seek to live out your truths with those around us who so desperately need hope. In this time, more than many other times that I've seen, we need hope. 
hope of a God who is loving and caring and here for us and has offered salvation, may we offer that to those around us as they desperately seek it. God, I just commit this week to you and ask that you will just do a work in our hearts and a work in the hearts of those around us. May you draw many to you. May this be a time of great turning to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. All right, why don't you stand for our benediction? Again, I'll remind you, there's sign-up sheets out in the back. Make sure you look at them and, and then grab coffee as you, as you leave and uh, take time to greet one another and to encourage one another. Receive this benediction from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. Thank you. You may be seated. You may be dismissed. Have a good day. Hey everybody, thank you again so much for tuning in to our online service this morning. We just want to remind you that if you are joining us for the first time um, online and you've never come in person, we would love for you to be able to fill out a digital connect card. The way to do that is you go to our website, kmcc.org, click on contact us at the top of the page and you fill out the contact us form right there and it'll send us an email. We can get in touch with you. That's so we can pray with you if you want to send us prayer requests or if you just want to call us and want somebody to talk to you about whatever is going on in your life, we'll be more than happy to do that for you. Also, you can give online, same website, kmcc.org. Click the give button right there at the top of the home page. It'll take you to a new website. You can give your donations or offerings that way. There is also an option to give to our benevolent fund, which is in the, um, the online give portion of the page. And what that is, the benevolent fund is a fund that we use as KMCC to reach out to our community, to reach out to families in need, um, and just be able to minister to people that way. So if you'd like to give to that as well, that'd be awesome. Um, but that's up to you and how you feel the Spirit is leading you. Anyways, thank you again so much for tuning in and tuning next week for another online service. Thanks.